Hello everyone, I'm Sam and today we are talking about Walgreens stock. In this video, I am going to walk you through our complete investment process where we will do a quick company health check. We're going to run some numbers and do a full intrinsic valuation calculation. We're also going to check to see if any super investors are currently invested in WBA. And finally, if you stick around until the end of this video, I am going to give you a peek inside our portfolio so that you can see exactly what we're doing to build a position in Walgreens Boots Alliance. There's a lot to cover today, so let's dive in. Step one, the company health check. As value investors, we believe that whenever you are buying shares of a company, they aren't just random stocks that are numbers on your computer screen. We are treating this as if we are becoming a partial owner of that business. And so therefore, we always start by trying to understand the story of the business and the financial fundamentals. When it comes to the story, there are three things right off the bat that we have to consider. The first is that we understand the business. And this means that we understand what the products are, how the business makes money, and we have a good idea of who their competitors are. Number two, there has to be honest and capable management leading the business. And number three, we want to make sure that the business has strong, durable, competitive advantages. And by starting with these three things, we are really protecting our investment for the long term. In the case of Walgreens, I've already done a bit of research onto the story of the business, and I feel like those three requirements are met for us. Now, if you want to do your own research, I will link some good resources for you in the description. And so now we move on to the financial fundamentals. So these are numbers. These are financial facts about the business that are publicly available that can give you insights into how well the management does. We want to look at how they allocate capital. Do they get a good return on investment? Are they protecting the value for shareholders? And how might they respond in case of an economic downturn? So let's dive into some of the financial fundamentals for Walgreens. So let's head over to Morningstar.com and see what we can find. Now we I prefer the Morningstar website because it's free and it usually has company data for the past 10 years. To get the data we're looking for on Walgreens, we will type the ticker symbol into the search bar here in the upper left hand corner, click on the company, now go to the key ratios tab, and then click here on this link for full key ratios. And this takes us to the page that we need. So the first thing that we want to understand is the company's ability to pay off its debt. And essentially we are going to compare the free cash flow with the long-term liability debt that the company has. And as a rule of thumb, we love to see that a company would take five years or less in order to pay off all of their long-term liabilities with their annual free cash flow. Now, obviously the lower the number, the better, but for us, a trigger is if it's more than five years, that means we need to dig in deeper and better understand understand this debt. So let's take a look and see what's going on with Walgreens. Scroll down until you see the row for free cash flow. Last year, Walgreens had nearly 4.2 billion in free cash flow. But if we also look at 2019 and 2020 and the trailing 12 months, it seems that they have been hovering closer to around 4 billion. So just to be on the safe side, that's the number that we're going to use. Okay, and now we need to take a look at their long-term liabilities. To find this, we click on the tab that says financials, and then this tab that says balance sheet. Then scroll down to find the row that says total non-current liabilities. And for last year, that number is a little over 35 billion. If you divide 35 by four, it gives us a ratio saying that it's gonna take them about eight and a half years to pay off that debt. So that's kind of a red flag for me, which means that we need to dig in a little bit deeper to understand what this debt is. So as we explore, we can see that on the same page, they have 22 billion in capital leases. This is the rent that they are paying on all of their retail spaces. And this is a cost that is really common and expected with any kind of brick and mortar business like the Walgreens and the Boots pharmacies. If you were to remove this debt from the equation, that would bring their debt down to the point where they could pay it off in four years. Now, I'm not saying that I would give it a complete green flag. However, this does ease my concerns a little bit and it gives me enough insight to know that I want to continue on with the valuation process. So now we move on to return on invested capital. We really love to see a strong ROIC because it indicates strong leadership. And as a rule of thumb, we love to see 10% or higher. We are back on the key ratios page and find that in 2021, the ROIC was about 5.5%. However, over the last decade, they are typically close to 10%, and in the TTM, they are over 11%. This tells me that we need to keep an eye on this metric, but for now, I'm okay to give it like a light green check and move forward with our next step. 
And that next metric is growth. So we like to see steady growth between revenue, net income, and most importantly, cash flow. We are still on the key ratios tab, and now we are going to compare data from 10 years ago all the way through to last year. Looking back 10 years, their revenue was at 71 billion, and last year it was at 132 billion. That's good growth. We can give them a check there. Their earnings were 2.1 billion, and last year it was 2.5. Obviously not as steady of an incline, but it's still growth, so we give them another check and their free cash flow was 2.8 billion and last year it was 4.2 billion another check okay this is our most reassuring metric thus far so the next thing that we're going to take a look at is the shares outstanding because we want to get an understanding of if they are diluting shareholder value or not now when a company issues shares unlike a stock split this actually reduces shareholder value in the short term and sometimes we see companies doing this in order to bring on cash to grow their business or to sustain their operations now chris and i much prefer a company who is able to do this with their cash flow not by issuing shares so here we are back on the key ratios page and we can see that 10 years ago their shares outstanding were at 880 million and today they are at 867 million but as you can see this is not a constant decline over the past decade this triggered me to do a bit more research, and what I found out was that WBA over the past decade has grown their business by doing some mergers and some acquisitions, and at the time they issued a bunch of new shares. But what you see is that starting in 2017, they started buying back shares consistently because they wanted to reduce the shares outstanding. And again, this is another good sign for us, so I'm very happy to give them a check here for shares outstanding. And the last thing on our company health check is the safety of the dividend. Currently, WBA is yielding 3.6% on their dividend. And what we want to do is, again, use that free cash flow number to determine how comfortably they can continue to pay this dividend. Okay, we're still on the same tab to get the data that we need, but we just have to do some simple math and take the number we see in the dividend row, which actually represents the dividend you will receive per share and we're looking in the TTM column and see it listed as 1.89. Now we take 1.89 and multiply it by the 866 million shares outstanding to see that in the trailing 12 month, they paid out approximately 1.63 billion in dividends. So if we compare that 1.63 billion against that 4 billion we had used for our free cash flow earlier in the video, we can see that they are very comfortable in paying out this dividend. It's less than 40% of their FCF. So again, I will give them another check here. I feel like the dividend can be paid out comfortably. And that is the final check on our company health checklist. It's not a perfect bill of health, but for me, there are enough green flags to continue and proceed on with doing the intrinsic valuation. Part two, intrinsic value calculation. Let's move on to the valuation process. Now, this process is essentially our attempt to predict future value to decide what we're willing to pay today for those shares. It involves looking up some data online, plugging in a few key numbers into calculations and making some informed judgments. And it is so important to determine the value of a stock before you invest in it, because that's what's going to protect your investment for the long term. Remember, price is what you pay and value is what you get. And we want to know the value of a company before we invest in it. You ready to start crunching some numbers? We are going to value Walgreens using a discounted cash flow method, and we are going to use a terminal multiple after 10 years. And this means that we are going to forecast the cash flow for each of the next 10 years, and we will assume that we will sell the company and collect a lump sum. Then all of these cash flows will be discounted back to a value of today by our desired rate of return. This method requires five key numbers shares outstanding, trailing 12 month free cash flow, expected 10 year growth rate, free cash flow multiple in 10 years, and your desired rate of return. Okay, let's start with the easy stuff first. So we already know the shares outstanding from the company health check that we did a little bit earlier on in the video. And for the trailing 12 month free cash flow, all we have to do is look that up online. So let's plug in those numbers. We know that it was 867 million for shares outstanding. And we just have to go on to morningstar.com. And again, we're looking at the key ratios tab. We scroll down and find the free cash flow figure under the TTM column. Okay, we've got it. It is 4057 and that is in millions. So now I can enter that number into my cheat sheet as well. 
Okay, here's where the real work begins. In order for us to get our number for the expected growth rate, we are going to have to make a prediction on how we think the company is going to grow over the next 10 years. And in order to do this, I'm going to look back on the past 10 years to try to get an idea of how they might perform in the future. So I would argue that this is the single most important number that we are going to plug into our valuation calculation. And it's also the most subjective. Different investors have different way of figuring out this number, but because it's so important, Chris and I like to do a little extra work here. I actually have a separate tab on our Excel spreadsheet, which I am going to show you exactly what we do. And we actually, calculate the historical growth rates in two different ways. As a starting point for both methods, we pull data from Morningstar to plug in the correct numbers for free cash flow for the past 10 years. And for WBA, it looks like this. Now we can apply the compound annual growth rate formula, which you see here on your screen. And we like to embed this formula into our Excel sheet. This is what it looks like in our spreadsheet for free cash flow. Now notice that it is pulling numbers from the cells that show you year one and year 10. And using the CAGR formula, we get 4.2%. So I think this is a decent starting point for figuring out the historical growth rate, but the problem with this method is that it only compares year one and year 10, and it ignores all of the numbers in between. So if you are going to only use this method, make sure that the numbers you plug in are not outliers, because if they are, they can really mess up your calculation. And this leads me to method number two that we use for calculating the growth rate, and that is to plot it in Excel. And I'm gonna show you exactly what we do. Okay, remember that 10 year data table? Well, we are now going to use this table in order to create a scatter plot chart. Highlight the table and then go to the insert tab. This little guy is the symbol for scatter plot charts. Select the option that has the dots. Now I'm just making it a little bit bigger so that it pleases my eyes. And if you left click on one of the dots, you get to see a menu option appear to add a trend line, click on it. This brings up a sidebar. Choose the options for exponential and then scroll down and be sure to check the box to display the equation on the chart. X out and there you have it. Now all you have to do is zoom in. You can use the exponent of the equation. All you have to do is move the decimal places over two spaces to the right and that gives you your percentage. And this method gives us a result of 5%. So Chris and I really like this method because we feel like it is more complete and it's like a very good visual representation of how the growth has performed over the past decade. And it's really easy for us to see if there are any outliers and it can give us a trigger to be like, oh, we need to research and see what happened during this year. The only thing to be aware of is that this methodology only works if all of your numbers are positive. So be careful and watch out for that. Okay, so looking at the numbers we just calculated, there is a small difference between 4.2% and 5%. As a rule of thumb, I tend to be really conservative when it comes to our calculations and putting in different growth rates. So my instinct is to just lean towards doing 4%. However, as a third layer of assurance, I just wanna head over to Yahoo Finance and I wanna check out to see what the analysts are predicting for the growth of Walgreens in the future. And after doing a quick survey, I can see that they are also saying 4%. So 4% is what I feel comfortable with plugging into our equation for the rest of this valuation process. Before we move on to the next step, I just wanna say that it's really important to remember that past performance is no guarantee of future results. So it's really important that you add narrative to the story that the numbers are telling you and you back it up with research. And the way that you do this is by reading the annual reports, you want to listen in on earnings calls which are publicly available. And you can also listen to interviews that management gives in order to have insights into the future of the business. All right, and we are on to our third key number, which is the free cash flow multiple in 10 years. So essentially what we are trying to determine is the free cash flow multiple that we assume Walgreens is going to have in 10 years when we are assuming that we are selling the business. For this, I'm heading over to Seeking Alpha to look at Walgreens historic price per free cash flow. We do have a paid account to Seeking Alpha, which allows us to access this data. Okay, I'm going to enter the ticker symbol, and then I click on the charting tab. Then in this little drop-down menu, I choose price per free cash flow TTM. And because I want to see the past 10 years, I click on this button. And you can see it has gone between five and 20, and it has hit around 10 quite a few times. 
So I'm going to use 10 for our calculation. As a rule of thumb, I might go as high as 15 for this multiple if I really think that the company has a lot of room to grow. But in the case of a company like WBA, which is already quite large, I think 10 is a pretty safe number for our calculation. Now we need to decide what desired rate of return we have for this investment. And this is highly subjective because ultimately you are deciding how much of a return you want to get. In this case, we are going to use the number 15% and that's usually Chris and I's go-to number. Now, for some of you, that might seem high. For some, it might seem low. The reason we like 15% is because we know that if we were to just invest in the S&P, historically, return rates are around 10%. And so because we are taking on the extra risk and also doing all of this extra work to invest in individual companies, we want a return that is higher than 10%. Now, as a rule of thumb, we might go as low as 12% or as high as 18%, depending on on our strategy and the company. And later on in this video, when we actually run the numbers and do the final calculation to get our strike price, I'm going to show you how that percentage will affect our final results when we manipulate that variable. Remember, valuing a business is highly subjective and the rate of return that you want is going to change based on your risk tolerance, based on when you need the money, based on your retirement plan. There's lots of different factors. So this is really an individual decision that you need to make. All right, and to review, this is what our cheat sheet is looking like. Shares outstanding, 867 million. Trailing 12 month free cash flow, 4057 million. 10 year growth rate, 4%. FCF multiple in 10 years, 10, and desired rate of return, 15%. And with all of these numbers, we can now do our valuation. And remember, we are using the discounted cash flow method. And this means that we are using this method to estimate the value of our investment based on its expected future cash flows. A discounted cash flow analysis attempts to figure out the value of an investment today based on projections of how much money it will generate in the future. So. Off to the side, I've made a table labeled from year zero to 10. And I have year 10 listed twice because that's our terminal year. And we are assuming that that is when we will sell the business. In year 10, we put the trailing 12 month FCF value of 4057. Now we want to grow this number each year down the line. And remember, we decided that we are going to use a growth rate of 4%. Now I'm gonna zoom in, and this is exactly what the equation looks like embedded into our spreadsheet. And don't let the number symbols throw you off. This is just a shortcut that you can use when you're making an Excel spreadsheet that basically locks the numbers in your equation so that when you drag it, it doesn't mess up all of your formulas. So let's do just that. Drag your formula across, and those values will populate all the way over to year 10. Now remember, the second column showing 10 is there because this is the year that we assume we will sell the business. So in order to get this number, we have to take the value of year 10 and multiply it by the number we picked for free cash flow multiple in 10 years, which in this case is also 10. So 10 times 6,005 is 60,005. Now we can work on our bottom row, which is where we figure out today's value using the present value formula that you see here on the screen. We start with year one, and this is what the formula looks like once we embed it into our spreadsheet. Again, we are going to drag the formula across to populate the figures all the way through to year 10. And now we need to figure out what our total is. So all we have to do is just sum up all of these cells. And that brings us to a total of 39,166. And now there is just one more step to figure out our strike price. All we have to do is take this number and divide it by the shares outstanding, which in this case is 867. And this gives us a share price of 4518. On the day that I'm filming, Walgreens is trading at right around $52. So it's very close to being a good investment for us. But before we move on, I promised you that I would show you how that strike price is affected if we were to change our desired rate of return. So let's head back to the spreadsheet and I'll show you a couple of different variables and what that does to the end result. All right, so if we reduced our desired rate of return to 12%, we get $54. And if we were to increase it to 18%, that drops our strike price all the way down to $38. As you can see, that's a big difference, but as I said before, your desired rate of return is something that you have to choose based on your individual needs. On to part three, super investors. 
Now that we have our strike price, I want to head over to Dataroma and check to see if any super investors are either buying or selling WBA. Currently, there are three super investors invested. A couple are reducing their position size recently, but that isn't really something we view as a bearish sign because they could be selling it for a number of reasons. For us, checking on super investors isn't a deal breaker. Again, we are just trying to mitigate our risk as much as possible. So it's just, again, another added layer of security, um, an interesting thing to see before we would pull the trigger on an investment. But again, it's not make or break. Part four, our portfolio. As discussed at the beginning of the video, Chris and I are currently investing in Walgreens. Once we have found a company that we want to invest in and that is trading at near to our strike price, there's a technique that we love to use to build our position and that is selling put options. And that's exactly what we have been doing for the past few months. We started building our position in WBA back in November. And as promised, I am now going to share with you all of the different trades that we have made in order to build our position. But before before I do, I just want to give you a friendly reminder that I am not a financial advisor and I'm definitely not your financial advisor. So please do not take what I am sharing in this video as financial advice. Here it is. We bought 50 shares on the 11th of November at 49.39 and we sold put option contracts expiring on the 19th of November at a strike price of $48. Each contract requires us to buy 100 shares of Walgreens if the price drops below the contract strike price, but for this we get paid a premium of $120 which we get to keep whether we have to buy the stock or not. WBA closed at $46.98 on November, so our options expired in the money. We bought 200 shares at $48 a share. We then sold more put options contracts every month, which you can see detailed here in this table. So we are doing this to continue to build a position in Walgreens while reducing some of our risk because we are getting paid that premium. And if we get put the shares, it's at a price that we feel comfortable with. So we see this as a win-win. It generates cash flow. It reduces our risk by reducing the price that we are willing to pay for the share. So that's why we like using options. And as of today, we currently own 250 shares of WBA with an average cost of 48 28 per share. Our position has appreciated in value nearly 9%. And in addition to this, we have collected $570 in option premiums and $23.88 in dividends. All right, everyone, that's it for me. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Before we go, I really wanna know what price would you pay for Walgreens stock? Let me know in the comments. Also, if you have any ideas or requests for companies that we should do valuation videos on in the future, I would also love to hear your feedback on that as well. If you like this video, please let me know by subscribing. And you may also wanna check out some of our other valuation videos. Remember, earn more, spend less, and invest the rest. And I'll see you next time.